Greetings, scholars. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, the, today's lecture um, will cover uh, chapter 14. Uh, so what we'll talk about is uh, psychological disorders. Uh, we'll talk about a uh, variation of different categories of psychological psychological disorders to uh, include uh, anxiety disorders, PTSD, OCD. Uh, we'll also mention and talk about um, depressive disorders, uh, disassociative disorders. Uh, we'll talk about autism. Um, we'll also talk about eating disorders, uh, and uh, and we'll kind of end on that. But there are so many different categories of uh, disorders and how we classify them, uh, and we'll talk about um, how we do classify um, with certain criteria that uh, clinicians use to determine if someone has uh, specific disorders. And so we'll talk about that uh, as we move forward. Um, we also want to talk about the um, we we'll talk about uh, psychological disorders uh, in chapter fifteen. We'll talk about ways in which we uh, treat them um, through you know, insight therapy, through behavioral therapies or cognitive behavioral therapies, uh, and then through uh, biomedical therapies. And so we'll talk about that in chapter 15. Um, but chapter 14, uh, we just want to highlight uh, some of the more, the more common um, categories of, of psych psychological disorders and what are the causes? You know, when we talk about etiology, what are the causes of those disorders and how do we uh, better um, how can we better diagnose them uh, in order to uh, treat them in a more effective way? Okay, let's get this started. All right, so, um, you know, one of the questions that you should ask yourself as we go through the beginning of the lecture is, uh, what, do, what do we determine and uh, classify as normal uh, versus abnormal behavior? And uh, one of the keys um, to making that distinction is, you know, what, is, what do we see the average person doing? You know, what uh, are the societal norms that we have in our, in our environment and how does that change? Uh, how does that change in those behaviors become uh, or, or change from normal behavior to abnormal behavior? And obviously, um, when you're looking at abnormal behavior, um, if someone is having a heart attack, you're going to see them moving and behaving in an abnormal way. And so, you know, something is wrong with an individual just based on how they they're moving, right? Um, if somebody's having a stroke, um, you can see, you know, um, the, the paraparalysis in the left side of their face, um, you know, their, their left side of their bodies not being able to move. You can determine that because it's abnormal. Uh, the same thing happens with psych psychological disorders. There is a, a quote unquote normal way of thinking, uh, behaving, and then there, there are abnormal ways uh, in which we behave. We can determine that pretty naturally. Uh, even in our own life, uh, you know, we've we've all had moments where uh, we didn't feel the best, right? Maybe we were extremely stressed out, right? And so that's not normal uh, for us to be extremely stressed. But and then maybe it is for some people. Uh, but again, normal um, is really in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. Uh, and so, you know, what you deem as normal may be different than what I deem as normal because our perspectives uh, and our situations and circumstances are different and have been different over the course of time. So again, how do you distinguish? It's really based on uh, some of the factors and your past experiences. And, and so we'll talk about that as we move forward, okay? So when we talk about abnormal behavior and abnormal behavior, uh, I love to talk about OCD um, to begin because um, many people um, joke around and say that they have OCD because they like a clean room or you know, they, they like to pick up the pick, pick up after themselves, right? But that's not necessarily having OCD. Um, OCD, uh, again, as you see the stat there, about one in 40 people in the United States um, have OCD or are diagnosed with OCD, which is a mental condition. Uh, you have what we call obsessive and compulsive disorder. Uh, obsession, meaning I'm having a true, intrusive thoughts about something that I have to do uh, or something that uh, is just uh, pressing in my mind, right? And then the compulsion is the behavior. I have to do this behavior in order to feel better, right? And OCD creates this tension or this anxiety in, in a human. And it creates uh, the anxiety and, and it gets to the point where we have to do something in order to kind of reduce the anxiety. Um, so if I'm a germaphobe and I have this anx these anxious thoughts about germs, then I'm going to wash my hands as many times as necessary just to feel better about 
my hands being clean and free from germs. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of household names, like TV personalities, musicians, and athletes who also struggle uh, and have been diagnosed with OCD. Um, and again, uh, actresses like uh, you know Jessica Alba, right? So she'll unplug every single appliance in her home um, before she leaves because she feels like uh, they may catch fire, right? She also checks and rechecks her doors to ensure that they are locked. And when she leaves home, she's always thinking about whether or not she's locked the door, right? Um, and then Howie Mandel, um, you know, uh, you know, he, you know, the deal or no deal, right? He's a famous hotel, uh, fa famous TV tele television host, and you would not even understand or recognize that he has has an issue. But um, he talks about his fear of germs uh, and his inability to tie his own shoes because of the dirt and the fear of germs. Uh, he's also been said to have shaved. He shaved his head uh, because. You know, he feels that having a shaved head makes him feel clean, right? So all of those different things um, create um, the, accept, the obsession, uh, again, that intrusive thought and the compulsion, which is, again, the behaviors uh, in order to try to reduce that tension and anxiety that we feel. So here's a picture of, of Howie Mandel, right? Many, many people were like, oh, I didn't even know he had hair. But yes, at one time in his life, he had hair and it wasn't and his hair. Uh, he has a full head of hair and he didn't shave his head because he was going bald, right? He shaved his head for the very reason of having OCD and saying, again, in his autobiography, he states that he shaved his head because uh, it made him, made him feel, made himself feel clean. Okay. So when we talk about um, psychological disorders, we're going to talk about the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. How do you diagnose someone uh, with a psychological disorder? Right? How do you di diagnose someone with uh, OCD? Right. Uh, OCD, um, there are certain symptoms that are presented uh, with someone who has OCD and the medical model. Um, this is that view that uh, it's really, really useful to think of abnormal behavior as uh, as a disease. Right. We think of it as a disease because with the disease, you can, first of all, diagnose it. You can figure out what the cause of the, the disease is, and then you can kind of set a prognosis and treat the disease based on what that prognosis is, right? Um, for someone who sprained their ankle, right? Uh, the doctor changes, checks the range of motion, determines the structural damage that might be done to the ankle. And then based on the structural damage, the swelling, uh, maybe MRIs, and uh, x-rays, then they make a determination of, you know, whether it's high ankle sprain or low ankle sprain um, and what the prognosis is. How, how will we treat it? How long will you be out, right? Uh, you know, when athletes uh, get a get a bad prognosis, man, you know, you tear your ACL, you're out for an entire year. You twist your ankle, you may be out for a couple of weeks. Right. So, again, the prognosis is really important. And the diagnosis lets us know uh, what we have and it distinguishes one particular illness from the next. OK, uh, but the medical model uh, was, was, has become really dominant and became really, really dominant in the 19th century, uh, especially um, at the end of uh, the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but prior to the 18th century, right, anyone that had any abnormal behavior, um, any any abnormal um, thoughts or, or or the way they they, they moved and behaved, uh, it was really based on superstition, right? They felt like those who uh, had abnormal behavior, they were either possessed by something, um, they were witches, uh, or they were just victims of God's punishment. Now, those were just superstitious beliefs of why someone would be struggling with uh, you know, abnormal behavior or physical, mental illness. Uh, the medical model generated some improvements to treatment, right? Because it allows us to diagnose uh, in a more specific way uh, and gives us um, the, the idea to be able to diagnose it with using symptoms and criteria that help us to identify uh, a specific um, illness, right? Uh, one, of the, the crit one of the downsides to the medical model, which has been uh, critiqued by uh, by many supporters of the mental health movement is that uh, the model the medical model does promote um, derogatory labels, right? Uh, stereotypes, social stigma. I don't like um, when people use the words um, crazy or mentally or, or retarded, right? Those are, are those are not good terms, right? Those are stereotypical and create a social stigma. Uh, when you call someone crazy. Um, you're you're creating this stereotype, and that, that's a derogatory label that you place on someone who is struggling with a mental illness. Um, and you know, I say that because many of us will 
or may have already struggled with a mental illness, maybe not as severe as others, but we all will struggle with something um, in our lifetime. So it's important that we uh, take great care in how we label um, those types of mental and psychological disorders, right? There are also some biogenetic explanations that have both positive and negative implications on how we identify, um, you know, what the physical and uh, not the physical, the psychological illness is, right? So now we know that there are things that are happening in the body that we can control and help, right? Through diet and um, through uh, exercise and, and all those different things to help to mitigate some issues, right? Uh, and so, you know, with the biogenetic explanations, uh, again, it allows us, you know, with um, any disease, this maybe maybe it can be a cure, right? If we're, we're thinking that it's a disease, diseases can be cured. So with psychological illnesses and psycho psychological disorders, they can be cured. That's one of the, the, the positive uh, implications to it. But one of the negatives, obviously, is some people say that it can't be cured. When you have a disease of, of the mind, it's really difficult to cure. And so there's there's two sides of the, the coin, and one can be really, really positive in the way you look at it, and one can also be negative in the way that you also look at it. Okay. Um, so one of the alternative explanations to the uh, the medical model, you know, Thomas says uh, he asserts that strictly speaking, right, disease or illness can affect only the body, right. Uh, hence, there can be no mental illness. So this was a critic to, you know, there can't be any other mental illness. He, he talked about kind of an alternative explanation of what uh, a psychological disorder is. But what we've been able to understand is um, through research and brain imaging and, and through, uh, you know, continued research and, and case studies, we've been able to see that the, the brain can be mentally uh, ill and can be disturbed. There are structures in the brain that can be affected through uh, different developmental um, deficiencies or, you know, defectiveness or just through stress uh, and the chemical makeup in our body and our brain then uh, lends itself to creating these psychological disorders like, you know, high stress, you get anxiety, you get depression, uh, you get bipolar disorder, you get um, uh, disassociative disorders. Again, and we know that because of uh, the, the, the vast amount of research that's been studied over the last uh, couple of centuries. When we think about the medical model, the medical model includes three uh, distinct concepts. Okay, one of them is the diagnosis, the etiology, and the prognosis. Uh, like I talked about, talked about before, uh, when we talk about a diagnosis, uh, just like when we sprain our ankle, you're diagnosed with uh, a high ankle sprain or low ankle sprain. Or when you go into the doctor uh, and you list off your symptoms, of, uh, you know, runny nose, headaches, stuffy chills, they'll say, okay, either you're, you have an infection, maybe a sinus infection or the flu, right? So again, you're able to distinguish from one illness from another, right? Just this based on the symptoms that are being exhibited. Uh, the etiology then is what is, the, what is the causation, right? What is the developmental history of an illness? And so we're looking at what are those environmental factors? Uh, what are um, your personal factors, your individual factors that are influencing, maybe genetic factors that are influencing, uh, you know, the cause of the illness. And then the prognosis is just giving you a forecast about, you know, what what's going to happen with the illness, right? Is it is it something that is um, very mild and so that, you know, you may not have that much much issue with it? Or is it something that's more severe where you may need, uh, you know, intense counseling and therapy or uh, biomedical therapies with medicines uh, to kind of control and help to regulate uh, the, the differences in your, your, your chemical makeup, right? But again, with using the medical model, you're able to use some of the same terminology and it creates this common language, which is used uh, across the public health and uh, mental health uh, climate and sector, right? So it's important that you have the common name, the common language uh, so that we can communicate it not only to clinicians and researchers, but also to the general public, uh, because we all know what um, anxiety will look like, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and uh, depressive disorder, we can kind of determine what those things are because of the common language that is shared uh, in the mental health community. Okay, uh, Clinicians will rely, um, when we talk about the medical model, uh, and uh, determining if someone has a psychological, psychological disorder uh, through certain symptoms and then the severity of them. Um, and it relies on different criteria to determine what an individual should be diagnosed with, right? 
So deviance, maladaptive behavior, and personal distress are three criteria that clinicians use and rely upon to determine how severe uh, the psychological disorder is, right? So you go from, again, the left-hand side here and the normal and the, uh, the, the yellow here, and then as you move to the right, uh, you move more to the abnormal. Uh, and then individuals can be on this continuum, anywhere in this continuum. Uh, nobody's just always going to be, I mean, again, we're, we're just not solely normal, right? There are going to be moments where we, we have some deviance or we have some personal distress or we have some maladaptive behaviors. Uh, but those who are more severe will be a little further into uh, over to the right hand side in that, on that continuum, right? Uh, when we talk about deviance, deviance is uh, deviating from your behaviors are deviating from what the societal norms are, right? When um, you have societal norms, um, if you're sitting in a classroom and everyone's sitting still and listening to the lecture, and then someone just stands up and starts yelling uncontrollably in the, in the classroom, that would be considered deviant, right? Because again, it's very different from the normal classroom setting. So their behavior in that moment would be deviant. Maladaptive behavior is, is that behavior that uh, impairs your functioning as a person, right? So if you are an alcoholic or, uh, you know, you have uh, schizophrenia and it's causing you to miss work uh, or it's causing you to uh, exhibit different behaviors that are uh, creating tension and stress in your environment, which causes you to uh, have a negative, have negative outcomes, like you losing your job, or losing your home, right? that would be considered maladaptive behavior because it's not behavior that is helping you to survive and be healthy, right? And then personal distress is a personal um, a personal look at how you feel, right? So you have to tell me, uh, are you distressed or not, right? Personal distress, are you angry or do you, have, do you have anxiety? Do you feel lonely, right? Do you feel hopeless? All of those are different characteristics and uh, symptoms, right? And so you would have to let us know how you felt. Okay, are you feeling any distress whatsoever? And again, some people might feel distress where they, they feel kind of uh, dejected, feel apathy, and then others may not, even if they are experiencing personal personal distress, or deviance, but they may not be, um, I mean, they may, a deviance and maladaptive behavior, but they may not be feeling any personal distress. Someone with schizophrenia who, uh, is has these grandiose thoughts of themselves. They don't really feel anything. Um, they they feel like what they're what they're what's happening to them is perfect, right? They don't feel any anxiety. They just have deviant behavior and this maladaptive. Okay. So when we think about hoarding, right? I love sometimes watching the show Hoarders because hoarding. If we think about those three criteria, hoarding would per perhaps be um, really maladaptive and could also be uh, very deviant, but it wouldn't be personal distress. You can look at these young these, these young men right here. Um, they don't look like they're in any, any personal distress. They look like they're having a great time with all their collectibles, right? But what happens when, you know, you can't find your sink or you can't find your stove or your microwave to, to cook food for yourself, right? Then that would be pretty maladaptive because now it's, it's affecting um, your, your well-being and your, and your, lived, your lived outcome. Uh, when you walk into someone's house normally, you don't see all this stuff stacked on top of each other, right? So it's also deviant. You know, you're not going to see a lot of people who have, uh, again, piles and piles of beanie babies and stuffed animals and books all over the place, right? That's that's deviant. That's outside of uh, the society. Okay. So here, here are some here are some examples um, that I want you to work through. You can pause uh, to think about them, but I want you to think about the criteria and uh, in each four of these examples, think about the criteria and think about if if these examples meet any of those, those criteria. So I'll, I'll help you with number one. Right. So it says Alan's performance at work has suffered because he's been drinking alcohol to excess. It says several workers have suggested uh, he seek help for his problem, but he thinks they're getting alarmed over nothing. I just enjoy a good time once in a while, he says. Right. So if we were to think about this example. And I'm going to break it down. Um, it says Alan's performance at work has suffered because he has been drinking alcohol to excess. Right. So in this particular, this first sentence, it says his work has suffered. Right. And so if his work is suffering, that means that the drinking of the alcohol has become kind of maladaptive. 
because it's really affecting his effectiveness at work, right? The second sentence says several co-workers have suggested he seek help for his problem, right? Uh, but he thinks they're getting along with nothing. So when people start to notice and then continue to suggest that you seek help, that then becomes deviant because then now that's outside of the norm. That's outside of societal norms. Many people don't come to, to come to work or to school uh, or to class drunk, right? Many, some may, but that would then be deviant because again, many people um, societally don't come to work drunk, right? And then the last one says, I just enjoy a good time once in a while. So he's, he's thinking there, that he has no problem whatsoever, right? So he's not experiencing any personal distress at all, right? So in this example, um, there is a maladaptive behavior. There is some deviant behavior, but I don't sense any personal distress in this passage. Let's, let's look at the second one and then we'll, I'll, again, you can pause it and then go over the examples yourself. But again, think through the examples. Look, use those three criteria to be able to uh, and apply those three criteria to the examples. Number two says Monica uh, has gone away to college and feels lonely, sad, and dejected. Says her grades are fine and she gets along okay with her other students in the dormitory. But inside, she's choked with gloom, hopelessness, and despair, right? So if you look at the three um, criteria, let's look at the first one. It, it looks like she may be. It says she has gone away to college and feels lonely, sad, and dejected. Those are experiences that she's having. And by having those experiences, she is experiencing her personal distress because she feels lonely, she feels sad, and she feels dejected. Those, that's personal distress, right? But it says her grades are fine. She gets along with her, okay, with her, her students in the dormitory. But again, inside, she's feeling distress. So distress would be the only thing that I would check for the criteria. Because again, her grades are fine. She's not experiencing any maladaptive behavior, not exhibiting any maladaptive behavior. And she's not being deviant because nobody, nobody knows how she's feeling, right? It's all on the inside. And that's what personal distress is. It's the stuff on the inside that's affecting us that we may, other people may not see, um, but, we, but we do see. And we feel okay. So here's just you can write that you can kind of write that out on the example if you need to. But again, think about those examples. Think about each example um, and look at the criteria and look at and if they are met um, by each of these examples. Again, with Alan, uh, the maladaptive behavior and deviance was met, but personal distress was not. With Monica, actually, let me go ahead and do the check mark so you'll see. Um, pin. So uh, you know, Alan had. Maladaptive behavior, he had deviance, but he didn't have personal distress. Uh, Monica had, um, she didn't have maladaptive behavior, she didn't have deviance, but she did have personal distress. So you just go through, mark it up, um, and again, just see if you can kind of match those criteria to the examples to see where, uh, you know, how you can identify them. Okay. All right, so we talk about the criteria, right? The criteria with uh, it being maladaptive, personal distress, or deviant, right? So how do we classify these disorders, right? When we look at a diagnosis, we have to look at the symptoms. And those symptoms are then provided to and through the criteria that we, we found, it, right? Is it maladaptive? Is it, is it personal distress? Is it deviant, right? And the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that is, and that, that, that is created by um, the Psychiatric Association, and they use a categorical approach to identify different categories of psychological disorders. And those psych psychological disorders fall into a lot of subcategories, and we'll only cover a few uh, in this lecture for time's sake. But again, there are various, I think there's about 20 uh, different subcategories, and then there are specific diagnoses in each of those categories. And if you look at the uh, chart here on the screen, you see that uh, in 1932, with the first version of DSM-5, DSM-1, excuse me, there was a little over 100 uh, specific diagnoses, right? And then over the period of time, there was ex exponential growth of the, the specific diagnoses over time, right? So we went from a little over 100 to almost 550 um, diagnoses now in 2013. And there are many others uh, coming because of just the evolution of humans, right? So with different things, different stressors, technologies, there are gonna be different 
um, different diagnoses that are affect that are affect that affect people. Um, some other diagnoses that um, are, have been kind of created and new new diagnoses. Uh, there is a an intoxication to caffeine. People getting intoxicated with drinking caffeine. Um, there, there are diagnoses for young children who uh, throw temper tantrums on a regular basis. Um, there are binge eating disorders. There are, you know, overconsumption of alcohol. There's uh, tobacco use disorders. So again, there are other disorders that aren't necessarily completely psychological, but they are, right? Um, and they can be treated uh, with, um, with, with some type of psychological treatment. Right. So with, when you're, if you're having some kind of addiction, addiction is a mental disorder. Right. And so how can we treat that um, with uh, with proper therapies and techniques? OK. But again, there is a uh, there is some questioning about how do we categorize and how do we uh, have the categorical approach? And with categories, oftentimes that gives us kind of it draws this distinct line. Uh, between diagnoses and between these categories. But what we'll see later is that many of these diagnoses, many of these uh, mental illnesses, mental disorders overlap in some way, right? Um, so there is not this discontinuous diagnostic category, right? There is a, um, there is a continuum, right? So if someone has anxiety, they may also have depression. Um, and if they have depression, they may also develop bipolar disorder. Right. So there are certain disorders that overlap. Right. Someone with anxiety may also have eating disorder or depression. Right. So there are overlapping disorders. And so there may need to be a, a, a more of a continuous or continual so that we can identify uh, different mental disorders for um, a variety of people. Because, again, they are sometimes um, overlapping and impacting. So here are some of the major categories of disorders, and these are the ones that we will cover today. Okay, um, again, you got anxiety disorders. We kind of talked about um, OCD, but we'll also discuss PTSD, uh, dissociative disorders, depressive and bipolar disorders, uh, schizophrenic. So in each of these, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the symptoms, we're going to talk about some of the causes, uh, and then um, at the end, we'll talk about uh, you know. How do these overlap, right? Are, are there any overlappings of uh, these different disorders, right? So we'll talk about, again, uh, the different types, right? Because we'll have different specific diagnoses in these categories. Uh, and then we'll talk about the etiology or the cause of them uh, as we move forward. Okay. So we start off with anxiety disorders. Um, and anxiety disorders, uh, again, we've all felt anxious about something, um, but with anxiety disorders, when an anxiety disorder becomes an anxiety disorder is when it's chronic, right? When it's really, really chronic or when someone's having a panic attack, uh, it may not be uh, chronic, but it might be triggered uh, by some event, by some circumstance. Um, and so uh, when I was in college, I was taking a medication um, that was a stimulant. I think I was taking use XD at one point for a sinus infection and I was having a reaction to the drug, right? And, <laughs> and it was causing me excuse me, to have panic attacks. And those panic attacks were, again, just triggered by being in uh, in a loud room with a lot of people, right? That would just trigger this panic attack for me. And I would have to step outside of the room to kind of get myself back down, right? But again, um, one of the uh, mo most common um, anxiety disorders is uh, the generalized anxiety disorder, right? Uh, so this is, uh, this is contributed by uh, chronic high levels of anxiety. Right. Not tied to any specific threat. All right. So when I talk about panic disorders, panic disorders and panic attacks, they are tied to a specific threat or trigger. Right. But with generalized anxiety disorder, there is no specific threat at all. Right. It's just a constant worry about yesterday's mistakes and tomorrow's problems. We're always just worrying, worrying, worrying. It just creates this anxiety for us. Uh, the physical um, symptoms of uh, generalized anxiety disorder, these are just possible. Uh, many may uh, have trembling. Muscle tension, diarrhea, uh, dizziness, faintness, sweating, and heart palpitations. And if any of you have ever uh, done pub public speaking, right, we we have those those feelings, right. But think about having those feelings for a uh, a prolonged period of time. You can you can imagine uh, the muscle the muscle tension and the sweating and the 
dizziness uh, and the diarrhea, right? Because again, when you have this anxiety, your stomach because it starts to feel funny, right? Uh, and so we have to be mindful of that as we think about uh, different psychological disorders and anxiety from plays that we grow in them. Okay. Uh, other uh, anxiety disorders include phobias. And then we talk about phobias when we talk about classical conditioning. Um, in classical conditioning, you know, you have make an association with uh, a particular event or circumstance or object, right? So when we talk about phobias uh, and the specific phobias, uh, it's just it's a persistent and irrational fear of an object or a situation, right? And often that object or situation presents no realistic danger whatsoever, right? So if someone is afraid of heights and they're in a plane and, you know, they don't want to fly because of the, their fear of heights, again, it's not really uh, any any dangerous than driving in a, in, in a car, right? It's almost less dangerous than driving in a car, right? Or someone afraid of germs, Right or somewhat afraid of uh, closed spaces. Right, that's again realistically there's no danger in being in a tight space. But many people are afraid uh, of of those things. Right, and panic disorder is another uh, anxiety disorder. We talked about that before, but again, it's an anxiety disorder by that's caused by a sudden and unexpected recurrent attack. Right, and it's not tied to any threat whatsoever. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, well, it is, no, excuse me, it is tied to a specific threat, trigger, or event, right? So, again, you have a panic attack when you get into a situation and it triggers something, and then you start to have a panic attack. Maybe it's, your, it's a really, really stressful situation. Maybe you're having an argument with someone and it triggers a panic attack. Um, agoraphobia is a specific uh, phobia. Um, you also have, uh, again, the fear of going out into public, but again, irrational, right? presents no realistic danger. Yeah, there may be neighborhoods that are dangerous, but that should not hinder you from being able to go outside, go to work, um, and, uh, and and live a normal life. You know, that would be considered a maladaptive behavior if you were fearful of going outside. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder, obviously we just talked about that. Uh, obsessions, which are those intrusive thoughts, uh, and compulsion, which is, uh, you know, those, those behaviors that we have to do um, in order to feel and reduce some of that tension that we feel. Um, and then the last one, we talk about post-traumatic stress, uh, which is, again, tied to an experience of a major traumatic event, right? And it's usually some kind of uh, psychological disturbance. You think about um, July 4th and those who uh, served our country, many of them may have PTSD and experience more PTSD symptoms during 4th of July because of the fireworks, right? The boom and the... Uh, the 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 the, the, mim the mimicking it's kind of it sounds like gunfire gunshots right and so you know we have to be mindful of that when we're popping fireworks I'm always mindful of that um, you know my dog uh, is extremely terrified of fireworks right um, has definitely has a psychological psychological disturbance many dogs don't like them, right um, and so they they get this intense fear um, when when fireworks are, are sounding okay. So what, are the, uh, what is the etiology of causes um, of anxiety-related disturbances? Uh, so, you know, there are some biological factors. Um, when we think about biological factors, um, the, the key term here is what we call concordance rate, right? And the concordance rate is just the percentage of twin pairs or other pairs of relatives that exhibit the same disorder, right? So this says that if one twin has an anxiety disorder, um, this, this chart says that um, there's a lifetime risk of the other twin, 35% of the time having the anxiety disorder as well, right? Um, and so again, you see with uh, twins who, which have one that share 100% of their genetic relatedness, you know, about 35% concordant. So if one twin has it, 35% of the time, the other twin will have it, right? However, you see when um, fraternal twins, when, you know, they have, they only share about 50% of their genetic material and genetic makeup. Um, about 15% um, of fraternal twins have anxiety disorders. One is diagnosed and the other is diagnosed. Again, this also applies to family members as well. And so if your mom has a has been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, there is, is some likelihood that you may be predisposed to, to it. But, you know, again, what is that percentage? We don't know the percentage specifically, but there is a small percentage that does say that you have and are predisposed to certain anxiety disorders. Um, when we talk about 
um, conditioning and learning. That's another cause, right? Uh, you know, you you have this really traumatic event um, when you are a young child. Uh, maybe, you know, you get locked in the closet as a young child and you get locked in there and, and now you're just afraid. You know, you're knocking on the closet and, and you just get stuck in there until somebody comes to get you, right? So now you have a, a fear of, of closets. Um, and so that is a condition, right? Uh, and you've been classically conditioned to be afraid of closets and you don't go into closets, you don't like closets. And so that's a classical condition. Um, but again, uh, so here's an example again of another one. So be bitten by a dog as a child uh, creates fear and anxiety when around dogs, um, which is classical conditioning. So you stay around, uh, stay away from dogs to avoid anxiety, right? So the classical conditioning is you're being bitten by the dog and that creates the fear, right? And then the OC is what we call awkward conditioning. And so you're reinforced to stay away from the dog, right? You, you stay away from the dog, uh, you and you're you are avoiding the anxiety. So the operant condition that is maintaining um, the fear, that is maintaining the fear response, right? So the anxiety is acquired through classical conditioning, and it's maintained through operant condition, right? So again, you have fear created through an association between something, and then you stay away from it, and staying away from it then just prolongs uh, the anxiety that you experience. Okay. Uh, one of the last things we'll see here, again, preparedness being, uh, again, biologically prepared, right? Our ancestors were afraid of certain things for various reasons, right? And those uh, things have been passed down to us. So, you know, we acquire some fears more easily than other fears, right? So we'll be more afraid of, uh, you know, a snake or a spider than we would an SUV because SUVs aren't inherently scary, right? Unless we had a, a bad running with an SUV. But again, through evolution, we understand that spiders and, and, uh, and snakes at one point were dangerous. And so when we see them, we don't like them. And so we acquire more, some of those fears more easily than some of the things that we, we have in our environment. Okay. Uh, cognitive factors, again, excessive attention, focusing your attention on the threat uh, can create anxiety. Um, and just misinterpreting threats um, is also a thing. Uh, we'll also see uh, commonality among all of these psychological disorders. Um, high stress often helps to precipitate uh, and aggravate anxiety disorders. And uh, we'll see um, a little later that even high stress situations at, in, at, a, young, at a young age uh, can create a prevalence for uh, many psychological disorders that we'll talk about uh, as we move forward. Okay. So as a knowledge check, and we just talked about this before. Um, it says, how are anxiety responses maintained over time, right? So if we look at the example, the dog, uh, the child was bitten by the dog, which created fear and anxiety in the child, right? And now uh, the child stays away from the dogs uh, to avoid any anxiety or fear, right? So it says, how are anxiety responses maintained? Again, they are maintained by and through operant conditions. And again, you avoid something. Operant conditioning is you're reinforcing. Um, you staying away is avoiding, right? And as you stay away, you're avoiding the anxiety. So that's just a reinforcement for you to stay away from dogs. Okay. Disassociative disorders, right? That's another category of uh, disorders. Uh, so disassociative disorders. Uh, these disorders are um, are classified when people kind of lose contact. Uh, with portions of their consciousness um, and sometimes their memory, uh, which is kind of causing you no know, disruptions in their sense of their identity. So um, when you uh, are disrupted through your consciousness and uh, you kind of your memory lapses, uh, again, your identity may change. Right. Oftentimes, when we think about disassociation, if you think about disassociation, um, an example of disassociation would be um, you having a daydream. So you're daydreaming. Um, or you're zoned out, you're looking off in the distance and somebody has to snap their fingers in front of you to, to kind of snap you out of it, you were in a disassociative state, right? You were kind of outside of your, your present consciousness situation. And again, you were in that state. Um, people with disassociative disorders, um, it's a little more severe, um, but they are trying to escape reality in a certain way, right? Uh, and oftentimes when it becomes a disorder, it is involuntary. When you can do it voluntarily. You can just go out and drift off in space 
again, that's a voluntary thing and you can snap yourself out of it. But with someone who has a dissociative disorder, it's involuntary, which then causes problems uh, for daily functioning. So, you know, you have a, another identity and, you know, you're, you're not yourself. And so that creates a strain in relationships. It creates, uh, you know, problems with your on your job or in school. And so in order to kind of help, you need you, you might likely need treatment or counseling. OK, um, disassociative amnesia. Um, is that sudden loss of memory? We talked about the memories that are disrupted. And so it's not due to any normal forgetting. It's a uh, it's a, uh, a specific thing tied to uh, disassociation um, and disorders. Right. Uh, usually it's attributed to stress and these demands. Um, again, if you don't have a lot of uh, mental resilience, someone who has a low mental res mental resilience and has high stress and severe stress, again, they could really be triggered um, to lose and have dissociative amnesia. Again, to kind of escape um, the reality, uh, maybe it maybe you had a uh, some really traumatic traumas growing up. Maybe you know you had neglect, emotional neglect sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, you know, a death of a loved one, you're trying to disassociate yourself from that that pain uh, and the, the sadness that you feel. And so people disso disassociate themselves uh, through, again, severe uh, stressful situations that they experience. Um, disassociative identity disorder. Again, this is a disruption of identity uh, marked by kind of experience of two or more complete, um, very different personalities, right? Uh, formerly, it was called um, multiple personality disorder, but they've used disassociation because, again, it is a disassociation from your consciousness. And one thing that uh, is highlighted in the dissociative, dissociative identity disorder is that the individuals who have various disorders, um, when they have different personality types, those personalities don't know one another, right? So um, if I say, say, say something in my um, my uh, original self, and then I have maybe another personality, that personality won't be able to identify and remember what uh, I said with my original my original self, right? And so uh, Billy Milligan is a, an interesting case. He has a, um, it's a story on Netflix. And I think they said he had at least up to 24 different personalities. Uh, he was a murderer and uh, he was able to plead insanity due to this dissociative identity disorder, right? So they put him in, uh, they were treating him, they were trying to get him uh, intense therapies, and and they were able to kind of re rehabilitate him and get him back. But he was, he, he was killing. Uh, he was a murderer, right? And so it was really controversial because he was, he was walking free, right? He was doing things that he had no business doing, but he was walking free. He was still uh, in this murderous state, and he had various personalities. Um, he had a personality where he was speaking uh, a, a, an entirely different language, and he had no recollection of even learning that language. His his his, uh, his original self had no recollection of learning that language. Uh, he had another. Uh, he had a young lady identity, right? Um, he also had an identity that was uh, a kind of an Englishman, right? And so they had he had an accent. He spoke with an accent, and then when he snapped out of um, those identities, and he was uh, he was his normal self. He's an, he's, he spoke English. He, he sounded totally different. You can tell that he had a, a, a stark contrast in those those identities. And um, again, there's controversy because little is known about how how it's caused. Right. You know, we know that stress plays and severe stress plays a big role in it. But there there's very little, uh, you know. Causes um, that have been, have been researched and identified for for the disease. Right. Uh, when we think about DID, um, the amnesia um, is usually again, attributed to excessive stress. Uh, but you do have some skeptics, um, some skeptic researchers and theorists. Uh, many believe that people with multiple identities, uh, they come to believe it because of the movies they see or uh, the books they read. Sybil is a book. Um, I think they even created a movie from it where uh, someone had multiple personalities. And so when you see something, obviously you can be primed to act in certain ways to kind of act those things out, right? And those portrayals of those of, this, of DID, uh, that may reinforce, uh, you know, some of the, the therapy that they get, right? Um, you think about you, you as a therapist working with someone who has multiple personality disorder, especially someone with several personalities. 
then you know you you could get more notoriety um, which which creates more popularity um, and again um, with the movie that you see here on the right split I've watched it um, it's not as accurate because each of his different personalities kind of knew about each other right they knew about the weaknesses and the strengths of the other personality and so you know we have to be mindful about movies like that because they don't want us to trade um, certain psych psychological disorders in in the proper way. Okay. All right. So we've talked about anxiety disorders. We've talked about disassociation disorders. Uh, so now we'll talk about depressive disorders. Okay. Um, so one of the specific diagnoses and um, depressive disorders is what we call uh, major depressive disorder, uh, and this is characterized by persistent feelings of sadness and despair. Um, and it's specifically a loss of interest of, of things that used to be pleasurable. So at one time, you know, you used to have, um, you know, a joy in going hiking, but now you go hiking and you don't feel anything, right? Or you used to go to the gym, uh, you used to watch your favorite television show, and it, it's not giving you the same, the same feeling you once had, right? So um, anhedonia um, is that diminished ability uh, to experience pleasure. And that's one of the, the central features of major depression. You know, you, you try to cheer somebody up who's in a depressed state and it's hard to cheer them up. They don't want to smile. They want to laugh. Um, you know, and the things that they used to do, they don't really like doing anymore. Um, you know, I used to love going to the gym. Now I just don't, I just don't feel it. I don't feel it when I go in there, right? Um, usually the onset of depression, again, it can occur at any point in the lifespan, right? Uh, but on average, the average age is onset around 30 to 35. Um, you can see it um, earlier in, in life um, with uh, really traumatic events or trauma that happens in, in a child's life. Um, and when you see depression in younger children, younger children are usually uh, impacted um, in a more severe way, right? Because again, their brains are still developing. And when you have a, a developing brain, their, their depression um, becomes becomes a lot more severe, and uh, and so we have to be mindful of that in the environment that we place our young people in um, to to kind of create a supportive environment. Um, again, um, we estimate that about two thirds of uh, people diagnosed with major depression uh, experience more than one episode over their lifetime. So it's not something that um, may happen all the time, uh, but you might just have seasons. Um, you know, there are seasonal depression as well, right? So major depression, you know, it's kind of a persistent feeling. But you can you can have seasonal depression as well, right? Um, so there are different types of depression, um, the different severity. We talk about um, the severity of it and and how they are treated. We'll talk about in chapter fifteen. Okay, so that's depressive disorder. We talk about bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder, um, it's it's marked by both a depressed uh, and a manic period, right? So a depressed period is when again you got depression, so you you don't. Um, have a pleasure in anything, you feel down, you feel kind of out of it. But in manic episodes, um, it's the opposite of what your symptoms are in depression. During someone who's having a manic episode, you know, you have this euphoric state, you have this lot of energy, you have uh, kind of a, a, a brighter outlook on life, on life, right? Um, you're really, really excited about what's going on in your life um, and you, you're elevated, your mood is elevated, right? Someone who has what we call bipolar one, this involves full manic episodes, right? And then someone who is, has bipolar two and diagnosed with bipolar two, this involves milder hypomanic episodes with shorter duration, right? So with a full manic episode, I mean, you're going for maybe hours or days, right? And then you just have a, a falling off, right? Of a really depressive uh, mood, right? And then with bipolar, they're really mild hyper uh, hypomanic episodes. Uh, they're really in shorter duration, right? Um, another uh, disorder is what we call mood dysfunction, right? And mood dysfunction, you know, when you have depressive disorders, or manic disorders, they um, usually um, can complete a suicide and they suffer from psychological disorder. So it says most people uh, who complete suicide suffer from some type of psychological disorder, either depressive um, or manic state, right? If you think about if you're in a, in a major depressive state, um, usually people who are extremely depressed, they are hopeless, right? They feel helpless and they don't feel like they can go on, 
right? And so it's important that the treatment is catches that early, right? Because if you feel really, really down, you feel like you don't have anything to live for, um, that's the depressive state. Um, and so when you have symptoms like that, um, again, they usually complete suicide more often because of those, those disorders. Okay. Um, so what is the etiology? What is the cause behind um, depressive and bipolar disorders? Um, there is some genetic vulnerability, right? So we can be predisposed to mood, mood dysfunction, right? So either having uh, a depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, right? Uh, we are predisposed if our family member or relative has it and has had it, we are uh, more likely or predisposed to have it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we will get it, but there are environmental factors. There are individual factors that might contribute to your likelihood in uh, triggering, right, um, the psychological disorder. Um, neurochemical and neuroanatomical factors, right? So you may have abnormal levels of different neurotransmitters in your brain, right? Um, when you talk, think about um, the dopamine system. If you don't have a lot of dopamine in your system, or if you have too much dopamine in your system, you may see um, some different changes in your depressive mood state. So if you don't have enough dopamine, you're not you're getting enough serotonin in your system, because again, serotonin is a mood stabilizer. So if you have a, a lower level of serotonin, lower level of dopamine in your system, you may experience um, depressive symptoms. Um, there is a correlation between uh, depression and the reduced hippocampal valve volume, right? So the hippocampus is uh, related to, uh, is a structure for memories, right? So there has been some correlation that's tied to um, the reduced size of the, the hippocampus and depressive symptoms. Uh, obviously, hormonal changes, um, kind of in a response to stress may contribute to depression. So, you know, if you have you know, your hormonal hormones are not in, in balance. Um, so, you know, what happens when a mom has, uh, you know, has just had a child, right? Uh, they have that, you know, um, you know, they have pregnancy, they have the pregnancy and then they have, uh, you know, when they're in pregnancy and then after the pregnancy, they have depression, right? Um, and so that, that happens sometimes when their hormones uh, are not balanced and they have to take different, um, different hormones to kind of re-regulate. Uh, their hormones. Okay, postpartum depression is a thing. It happens, and oftentimes that is contributed to um, the cognitive thinking through certain things, negative thinking patterns, and then also uh, hormonal changes in, in, the, in the mother. The mother. Okay. Uh, some further etiology is again cognitive factors, uh, negative thinking, right? Ruminations or repetitive negative thoughts. Again, um, you know, pessimistic people being really pessimistic. Those who uh, are narcissistic, those who are always anxious, um, you know, are always kind of uh, thinking the worst. Um, interpersonal roots, so again, social difficulties, uh, maybe you lose your house, you lose your job, you know, really, really stressful things that happen. Maybe you, you have a bad breakup. Those things can uh, can kind of disrupt uh, your mood and lead to uh, depressive disorders. And then obviously, again, we talked about stress being a precipita precipitator, right? where, you know, it's a, it's a, a big uh, link between stress and many of the psychological disorders that we talk about, stress and anxiety, stress and, uh, you know, disassociative disorders, stress and depressive disorders and bipolar disorders. Again, stress is and can uh, explain a lot of the variance between um, some of these, the, these psychological disorders. Okay. Schizophrenic disorders, right? Schizophrenic uh, split mind disorders. This is uh, one of the, the major ones that we see a lot of the times. Um, you see individuals who have uh, schizophrenia, you know, it, it really uh, throws off their, their whole um, train of thought, right? And so um, usually those who are experiencing homelessness, you'll see many people who are experiencing homelessness. They, especially if they have a, a, a diagnosed mental illness, it's likely going to be schizophrenic, right? Um, so schizophrenia means split mind, um, and it's a fragmentation of your thought process, processes, uh, and it kind of splits uh, your personality, right? Uh, schizophrenia is marked by several different symptoms. Uh, some of them are um, a little more, um, you know, severe than, than the other, um, but there are different types of schizophrenia, right? 
Uh, so you have um, kind of hallucinations, you can have delusions, um, you can have kind of an undifferentiated uh, schizophrenia where, you know, you got to, you have uh, some, some movement in, you know, it's kind of all over the place. You don't know if you're going to have delusions, you, know, you don't know if you're going to have hallucinations, uh, disorganized thinking and speech, um, your maladaptive behavior, you kind of deteriorate, you don't wash, you don't, you don't brush your teeth, you don't comb your hair, you don't take showers, you don't eat. Again, you're deteriorating your adaptive behavior. Um, about 75% uh, percent of the cases uh, again, are manifest manifesting themselves by uh, the age of 30, right? Uh, and again, many of, again, we'll talk about the ideology, but many of the, the causes may be, again, stress, uh, predisposition from family members and, and relatives. But again, uh, about 1% um, of the population, um, so about 3.3 million people, uh, may suffer from schizophrenia. And that's just the, the cases that are have been, have been diagnosed, right? There may be some individuals who aren't diagnosed or going through um, their, their own world and haven't been diagnosed, so there may be more. Um, but you will see that over the course of time, uh, the prevalence of schizophrenia has has grown over the course of time. So, you know, at one point, you know, it was under 1%. Um, now it's at 1% or even a little bit above, about 1.5%. Um, so as we continue, again, the uh, the prevalence of certain mental and psycho psychological disorders uh, is be beginning to increase. Uh, individuals who do suffer um, do show an increased risk for suicide uh, and early death from natural causes. And so a lot of things that happen when you, you forget to eat or you don't do the things necessary, um, you don't have really good adaptive behavior, it can create uh, other issues on the, on the, on the back end. Um, you know, uh, maybe you're, you're doing things that are not, not healthy, doing drugs, participating in, in different, um, you know, uh, sexual activities that aren't healthy. Right. So again, we just have to think through uh, how schizophrenia is affecting the person uh, and then how do we treat it? And we'll talk about that um, in the next chapter. Right. There are what we call positive symptoms um, and negative symptoms of uh, schizophrenia. Positive symptoms are those things that are exhibiting themselves that you can see. Right. Um, like hallucinations, uh, delusions and coherent thought, agitation. So those are the things that are really positive, not positive, like in a positive, uh, but positive as in you are exhibiting them. Um, and and uh, they're, they're coming out um, in a positive way, right? Wild flight of ideas, uh, negative uh, symptoms. They kind of take you down and decrease what happens. Um, so, you know, hallucinations, delusions, they are kind of positive because they are adding, you know, your brain activity is increasing. And negative symptoms, um, you got flattened emotions, you got apathy, impaired attention, poor grooming. So you just stop grooming yourself, poverty of, of speech. So you you just don't talk as much. Um, um, and again, those maladaptive behaviors uh, can really influence a person's life if not uh, treated um, in a in an early on uh, in, in an intense way. So here are some of the positive and the negative symptoms and their uh, percent of patients that do exhibit them. Um, so you talk about the negative. Uh, so we'll look at, you know, 90% say they have few relationships. Uh, lack of persistence at, at work or school, few recreational interests. Uh, for the positive, you know, 81% say they have illusions of persecution. Some of they think they feel like somebody's attacking them. They feel like someone is, is out to get them. The, the government is, is coming to, to, to arrest them. Um, auditory hallucinations, 75% say they have auditory hallucinations, voices, they hear voices in their head. Um, Anderson Cooper of uh, CNN did a, uh, a, a demonstration and uh, he had ear earphones and he walked around uh, and it, they were, they had auditory hallucinations playing in his ears, right? And he was sharing his, his experience and he was trying to talk to the camera as the hallucinations began to increase, right? And it became very, very difficult for him to focus. And he began to talk about how, how difficult it, it made, it, could, it, it seems to be um, and would be for someone who has schizophrenia, especially when they hear those auditory hallucinations. Sometimes the voices that they hear are positive. Uh, other times they are not, they're very dangerous. And they, they sound very aggressive. 
And so that could be very, very detrimental to someone who is hearing that uh, over the course of time, um, persistently and consistently. Um, and chronically over over time. Um, some other symptoms, again, you got delusions and irrational thought. Um, again, delusions are those false beliefs. Um, you're kind of clearly out of touch with reality. Somebody's coming to get you or, or grant you. Maybe you, you feel like you're greater and bigger than you are. Maybe you feel like you're, uh, again, in the example that we saw earlier, you're no, Napoleon reborn and you're on a conquest to conquer uh, the, the United States and you're, you, you have a war coming and you're preparing yourself for war, right? That's a grand, um, you know, you got deterioration of your adaptive behavior. So, you know, your normal routine is um, is interrupted, right? So you don't go to work as, as you once as you once did. You, you don't uh, check on your friends and don't interact with your friends at the same level, right? You, you don't take care of yourself. You're not, you know, brushing your hair, brushing your teeth or going to take showers as you want to do it, right? So those symptoms, um, and as the, the the disease begins to progress, uh, some of the, the these symptoms become worse if they're not treated um, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, distorted perception, again, we talked about hallucinations, we talked about disturbed emotions, the flattening of emotions, uh, emotional volatility. So, you know, at one moment, you may, you may be really, really happy, and the next moment, they're really, really aggressive and, mad um and so you there's any really inconsistent and they're really volatile and so dealing with people who have schizophrenia you're always on edge because you don't know what what you're going to get because again their emotions may be more volatile um and so you have to be really on your on edge um, when you're dealing with someone who's not taking the medication because again if they are and do have disturbed emotions you just never know who you're going to get you may get someone who's really aggressive in one moment and then the next moment, they are really, really kind and uh, and happy. Okay, so when we talk about etiology of schizophrenia, um, there is some genetic factors that, again, may account up to eighty percent, right, of the variability is susceptible uh, to schizophrenia. So that means that um, genetics plays a big role in you being predisposed to um, maybe a relative or a uh, a very close relative, family member has schizophrenia. Uh, again, the genetic factors may play a big role in about 80% of the variability um, in susceptibility to schizophrenia, right? Uh, genetic mapping um, provides even more insight. Um, when you do genetic mapping, you're looking at parents, close relatives to see if somebody in the family has it, um, and then they look to see if other people in the family have it. And if they do see that overlap, then that kind of improves um, the evidence that show that there is some genetic factor that, um, you know, there's some vulnerability to schizophrenia and having schizophrenia uh, and being able to pass it down to the next generation. Um, neurochemical factors. Uh, the dopamine hypothesis kind of asserts that when people have an ex excess activity, uh, uh, excess dopamine activity, excuse me, um, that that might be the basis for schizophrenia, right? Again, it's just a hypothesis. Um, it hasn't been completely proven. And when you talk about a hypothesis, it, some some of them, some research has supported it, and other research has not, right? So um, again, when it's supported on a more consistent basis, then you might be able to to use um, use it. I said also marijuana use during adolescence, uh, methamphetamine use may be associated with schizophrenia as well. Right. So, uh, again, these are associations, they may not be strong associations, but again, there is an association. There is a relationship between uh, different uses of drugs and recreational drugs uh, and schizophrenia. Okay. Um, some abnormalities in the brain. Um, so, you know, CT and MRI scans, what, what, what happens when we're looking at some of the, uh, the biological functions of the brain? Um, with someone who has um, psych psychological disorder, will scan their brain to see if there are any abnormalities in the brain structure, right? Um, and so for the uh, for those who are exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia, um, it, there is some association with enlarged brain ventricles, right? So you look on the screen here, uh, you have these ventricles in the brain. You got, you know, left, right ventricle, third and fourth ventricle here, right? Right near the, the, uh, the brain stem. And again, these these are in, in case contribute to um, why individuals may have 
right? So if they're in large, you might see a better uh, and, and prevalence in schizophrenia. Uh, there's also reduction in both gray and white uh, in the brain, right? And again, these are these are not you know, always, but again, there is evidence to support it, and again, there's evidence that does not support it. Okay, and then the neurodevelopmental hypothesis are that uh, you know schizophrenia is caused partly by disruptions and harmful maturation process of the brain before or after. Right, so you know. Village traumatic events that happen um, can and and do influence the brain chemical makeup and structure, right? And so it's important that our environments that we uh, we grow up in are supportive, that they are stimulating, uh, mentally stimulating, and that you know we're not experiencing a lot of dysfunction and um, a lot of childhood and severe stress because again that uh, does and can disrupt the normal maturation process of the brain um, with Increased um, cortisol in the brain, increased dopamine, serotonin, all these different things in our brain that can influence the, the development. Okay, express the emotions. Um, again, agree, you know, that again, we got stress. Um, one of the, again, high plays a key role. Again, we talked about stress. It gets a common, a common thread among all of the psychological disorders. That's why we talk about stress. Uh, in chapter 13, really, really important to handle. It. Breathing exercises are important. Um, positive thinking, uh, get yourself out moving, right? Make sure that you are handling stress in a positive way because it is a common factor um, among a lot of the psychological disorders that we are mentioning. Okay. Uh, yeah, we said, talk about, you know, um, social support plays a big role. Um, and then the way we express our emotions uh, when, you know, relatives of schizophrenic patients display really high, highly critical or emotional over-involved attitudes toward the patient. Again, that can create uh, and trigger uh, certain things in the, in, the, in the individual who has schizophrenia. Um, autism spectrum disorder, uh, one of the other psych psychological disorders. Um, when you think about the uh, autism spectrum disorder, this is a childhood disorder. Oftentimes it is uh, diagnosed when the child is really, really young. Uh, and some of the things that you see in young people who uh, have autism, um, you have a, li a lack of eye contact, you have a lack of interest in socializing with other people, uh, you have a, a hyper focus on certain tasks or uh, certain objects or situations, right? Um, but again, it's an impairment um, of that social interaction and communication. Um, and they really kind of restrict your interest and your activities in certain ways, right? So maybe they have a, a favorite ball that they, they play with and that's all they play with. They have a hyper focus. Usually you can determine um, autism in young people uh, by the age of three, just by looking at some of those, uh, those impairments and kind of the social interaction, communication, eye, uh, eye contact, right? Uh, but some of the symptoms that the prevalences, uh, you got about, um, um, about eighty percent of the people uh, or young people who are diagnosed are male, right? Um, that's about eighty percent of the, uh, the autism diagnoses, um, and these diagnoses have increased dramatically since you know the mid nineteen nineties, and and that's that's because uh, you know the monitoring and the uh, evaluation process has been a lot more stringent, right? So every child oftentimes is going to be you know checked for cognitive delays and intellectual disabilities to determine if they have certain um, impairments, right? To so, to so that we can intervene in an earlier way, in an earlier time. Um, but again, here are some of the um, the different symptoms as well. You have lack of interest in other people. Uh, about 30, 30 to 40% fail to develop functional speech. Um, and then they usually have a preoccupation with objects uh, or repetitive body movement. So, you know, uh, one, you know, one of my mom, my mom has a student um, who who has to kick his leg up every time he walks by a certain, like maybe a, a, I think he kicks his leg um, is, and it's just a, a kind of something he does. He kicks his leg, kicks his leg, and that's kind of a repetitive body movement that he does. Um, or he, he, he kind of chops down um, and that's kind of another repetitive body movement, right? And so he just has a preoccupation with that body movement. 
Um, but again, they have been diagnosed with it at an early age and they've been dealing with it uh, and are in school uh, in, in classrooms to help them kind of cope um, with those symptoms. Um, some genetic factors um, that kind of are major contributors to ASD. Uh, usually, it's kind of associated with generalized brain enlargement apparent by age two, right? So they do MRIs and uh, they do brain imaging to see how large the child's brain is compared to, uh, you know, the average brain, the average size of the brain at those ages. Uh, one of the other factors they talk about is the uh, the neurons in the prefrontal cortex. So there's more active neurons in the prefrontal cortex that can contribute to uh, autism in young people. And just the overgrowth um, in those neurons and the activity and the disruptions in those neural, neural circuits that can, you know, again, hinder uh, and hurt, or not hurt, um, but um, kind of create and contribute to uh, the factors uh, for someone with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And again, um, you have more severe disorders, autism, and then you have less severe, where they're a little more higher functioning, Asperger's uh, syndrome, where the individual is, you know, really, really high functioning. Um, they just have um, a few symptoms that um, that they struggle with um, as individuals. Okay, personality disorders um, are another um, piece, right? Personality disorders are marked by kind of inflexible personality traits. Um, you know, they cause kind of subjective distress. They usually um, kind of impair your social reaction, your relationship that you have and occupational functioning. So, um, you know, you usually someone who has kind of antisocial behavior, you know, they're going to be um, really hard to work with. Uh, they're, they're, they may not be able to uh, maintain, you know, healthy relationships with individuals. And, and you know, they may jump off the handle. They, they usually have um, really volatile emotions. They kind of uh, jump off the handle right, right away, right, with no no kind of warning. You know, it could be something really, really small, and they just jump off the handle, right? Um, personality disorders um, generally become recognizable during adolescence uh, or early adulthood. And so you get to see different personalities as they evolve. And over the course of time, you know, the someone being a little more eccentric, is different, right? You know, you're looking at a uh, kind of the normal functioning and the normal normal kid in the classroom, and then there's just something off. Um, really eccentric, a little odd about someone. Um, you got hyper anxious and fearful people. Uh, you got really, really in dramatic and really impulsive individuals. Uh, again, those are the kind of the personality disorders that are grouped uh, into those different clusters. Um, someone who has antisocial personality disorder. Uh, they're really impulsive. They're really callous, manipulative. Um, they don't really take. Um, they don't really have any empathy for people. They don't. They can't really put themselves in any kind of shoes. Kind of like the per narcissistic personality disorder. But they really lack conscience. So, you know, they they do a lot of irresponsible stuff. Um, have a really lot of really lot of irresponsible behavior. Um, someone who has a borderline personality disorder. Um, they have kind of an instability in their social relationships, right? Um, they uh, think highly of themselves one day and then don't feel as highly on, on, of themselves the next day. And their emotions are always kind of fluctuating, right? Um, and they're, again, they oftentimes, um, they have uh, this intense fear of abandonment, right? And so I remember we talked about um, the anxious, ambivalent attachment stuff and how individuals with you know, a really anxious attachment style felt, felt kind of, uh, they had a fear of rejection. They didn't want to feel like they were being left alone, right? Um, so uh, usually people who have personality disorders usually have some social issues and relationship issues. Those who are narcissistic, um, these are individuals who have this grandiose sense of self-importance, uh, sense of entitlement, uh, an excessive need for attention. Individuals who and can develop these things, you know, there are some celebrities who develop uh, narcissistic personality disorder just by the sheer amount of celebrity that they are and the attention that they get. Um, and, and many people, uh, they just think they're extremely unique and superior to other people. Um, and they think that um, just based on certain environmental things that may have happened, situations that have happened. Um, so we'll talk about the ideology here next. 
right? But again, when we talk about personality disorders, um, there are there is some interaction uh, between the genetic factors and predispositions and environmental factors. Um, you know, our exposure to stress. We talk about stress, uh, our coping patterns, how we cope, and the resilience that we have, uh, and then our cognitive styles, how we think. Uh, do we have a more optimistic um, personality type? Um, do we, um, you know, are we open to experience? Are we more agreeable? Are we not more agreeable? Um, and then it also shows that some personality disorders uh, and can be influenced by heredity. So we talk about uh, the genetic factor. Um, data from the twin study shows that, you know, if one of the twins does have a personality disorder, the other twin may also have. Uh, a similar or same personality disorder as well. Okay. So there's a little knowledge check. Okay. So we're talking about personality disorders. You can already go ahead and, and cross off D because bipolar disorder is not a personality disorder. So the, the, the options will be from, from A, B, and C. Okay. So it says which type of personality disorder is characterized by appearance of self assurance? And confidence, even though self-esteem is actually quite fragile. All right. So think about someone who might be uh, an experience something, some someone who has self-assurance, uh, someone who has high confidence, but they have really, really low self-esteem. But you wouldn't know, and you wouldn't know it. This person would likely be someone who has narcissistic personality disorder. Right. So they might have a lot of insecurities, and in order to cope with those insecurities, they create this higher sense of self. They create this uh, entitlement and this uh, grandiose sense of who they are uh, to mask the fact that they have these insecurities and their self-esteem is not that high. Okay. Eating disorders, one of the last things we'll talk about. Um, eating disorders, um, you got anorexia. Um, eating disorders are really just severe disturbances uh, in eating behavior. Uh, you know, preoccupation with your weight, the way you look, uh, and you do certain things uh, in an unhealthy, unhealthy, unhealthy way, excuse me, uh, to control your weight. Um, purging by, you know, vomiting or excessive working out, starving yourself. Um, again, those are just unhealthy ways to uh, to control your weight, right? Um, fasting is not a bad thing, but when you do it to, uh, to control your weight in an unhealthy way, that's when it becomes uh, a disorder. Um, anorexia ner nervosa. Um, this is in, this is characterized. But this is one of the most common ones that we see um, and hear about. Um, you know, anorexia and bulimia, and then binge eating. Um, anorexia again is in care is characterized by this intense fear, seeing irrational, intense fear of gaining weight. Um, um, you know, they try to maintain uh, a weight, and they feel like no matter how small they are, they can't be small enough, right? Um, you have, and they do go through a lot of dangerous measures to to lose weight, they can either binge eat and then purge it, right, by, by vomiting, or they just restrict their eating altogether, right? They just don't eat at all. And you see them oftentimes excessively working out as well, right? So they work out a lot. So they're burning a lot of calories and not eating a lot of calories. And so that creates this huge calorie deficit. And then they begin to look um, really, really um, skinny and uh, their body is, is unhealthy, right? Uh, but they usually look in the mirror and they see their body as being fat, even though they're extremely small. Um, some medical issues that occur when someone has anorexia, uh, and amenorrhea, loss of menstrual cycle, um, gastrointestinal problems, low blood pressure, osteoporosis, uh, metabolic disturbances leading to cardiac arrest or circulatory collapse, right? If you're not eating enough food, if you're, you're working out excessively and, you know, you're not getting the proper nutrients in your body, your body will shut down. Your body needs proper nutrients. It needs rest. It needs it needs food to survive. All right. And you can't go without a lot of calories and expect your body to, to, to respond and perform. Um, uh, is, unfortunately, there was a young lady um, in, uh, in Germany. Um, she's a she was a um, an influencer. Um, on Instagram, and she had about 150,000 followers, and she would uh, talk about, um, you know, her her journey um, with anorexia. And unfortunately, um, she was on a flight, um, 
an international flight and she did not, she hadn't eat, eaten for like two days, right? I think she had a couple of cups of coffee, but she hadn't eaten for two days and her, her heart stopped, right? They had heart failure in 2020. Her friend, uh, she was, they, they were on the flight and she just fell, in, fell, fell into her, her friend's arms and passed away um, again. And she, she struggled with anorexia and she talked about her journey with anorexia. But again, the, the metabolic disturbances, again, do lead to and can lead to cardiac arrest. So it's important um, for those to have, right? Uh, the age of onset for anorexia nervosa, uh, you see that the highest uh, bar here, 40% uh, of the cases, they're around 15 to 19 um, years old. I want you to think about why that might be the case. Um, 15 to 19 as teenage years, why is that the case? You got teenage girls oftentimes, right? Um, you know, they have these images that they see on Instagram, TikTok, and uh, on social media and in movies, right? And they want to look a certain way. Um, and oftentimes, those are the individuals who are going to experience the worst and be diagnosed with anorexia more often than anything because of the image that they're trying to maintain. And it's not just women. Uh, it could be men as well. These cases don't just include women. Uh, they also include men who also struggle and can struggle oftentimes with, um, you know, disturbed body image, um, and and do and do unhealthy things to lose weight. Uh, bulimia is another um, uh, eating disorder. Um, it involves kind of the habitually eating, uh, engaging in out of control eating, uh, overeating, and then you uh, unhealthy compensatory others, right? So maybe self-induced vomiting, fasting. Uh, the abuse of laxatives and diuretics, and excessive exercise, right? So, you know, usually this is not as severe as anorexia because uh, psychologically they, they're just overeating and then they purge themselves, right? But when you purge uh, through vomiting, you're still getting nutrients. So about 50% of the nutrients are gone, but most of it is already absorbed. Uh, so you're getting your nutrients. And oftentimes... You know, you even when you kind of use laxatives and diuretics like that does not interact with the calorie and the calories that you intake. Right. That's just speeding up the process of, uh, you know, your bowel movements. Right. Uh, some, some medical issues that, you know, are associated with bulimia, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, dental problems through, again, throwing up, again, the acid in your teeth. Uh, metabolic deficiencies, obviously, you're, you're not getting all your calories, but you are getting most of them. Uh, gastrointestinal problems through vomiting, and, uh, the, the, the gases and the acid in your stomach. Um, but, you know, you think about someone who has bulimia, they're not going to look like they have a problem um, because of, you know, they're, they're getting more calories than someone who has an anorexia. But it's still a huge problem because they're, they're having unhealthy ways to compensate uh, for their out of control eating the, and the eating problem. Uh, can be the issue. Um, binge eating, right? Um, Distress-induced eating binges, uh, but you don't purge, right? You don't fast. Uh, you don't do excessive exercise as seen in bulimia, right? It, it's more common um, than anorexia and bulimia. Usually this is stress-induced, right? Um, usually you'll have individuals who stress eat, and, you know, that is a thing. Um, and they're going to gain a lot of weight. Um, they'll probably develop problems with obesity, uh, and they could, and it could progress into uh, bulimia. So, you know, overeating and then purging and, and doing things unhealth in an unhealthy way uh, to, to lose weight or to remove the food that you just ate. Okay. So, you know, why? Why, why is, you know, overeating, why is uh, eating, why, why is eating disorders a big deal? You know, um, why, why, what is the, what is the cause of it? What is the prevalence of it? Uh, most people um, with eating disorders um, are female. Um, but again, it's not to say that there aren't any male people, more male individuals who have eating disorders. Uh, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, uh, about 90 to 95 percent, um, again, are anorexic or bulimia. Um, again, you have about 5 percent, 10 percent who are male. Um, binge eating. Um, 60%, so about 40% of those who experience uh, binge eating um, are male. Um, and then societies, right? You got the Western cultures, uh, uh, there's a disparity in culture, uh, biological, right?
why eating disorders were unseen uh, outside of Western cultures, right? So about 1% develop anorexia in Western societies, uh, about, you know, one and a half percent develop bulimia, and then about three, three percent, three and a half percent develop binge eating. And these, you know, you being stressed, you're eating, you know, eating a lot of chips because, you know, you're stressed out. That happens. You know, you're stressing for an exam and, you, you know, you go get some ice cream or you eat um, some gummy bears like I used to do. But I didn't do it all the time. Right. It wasn't something that I did all the time. It was something that kind of just based on stress that I was having. It was kind of a comfort food uh, for me. Um, the ideology of it, um, you know, there is some vulnerability genetically. Um, but again, for the most part, you know, if your mom had an eating disorder, um, you may also develop one. But, um, you know, the variance um, and the, the, the concordance rate is not as high as other psychological disorders. Uh, just personality factors, right? Someone who is more narcissistic, not narcissistic, someone who is more, uh, you know, uh, pessimistic, someone who is um, neurotic, someone who is always thinking about the worst, um, really anxious about things. They may develop someone who is more rigid, emotionally restrained, may develop anorexia. There is this perfectionism um, complex where individuals have to look a certain way. Uh, and then people with bulimia often are impulsive, right? Um, have a low self-esteem. Um, so they overeat, they feel fat, and then they uh, or feel obese, excuse me, and then they throw up, right? Uh, media obviously promotes uh, an importance of thinness um, to be attractive, right? And again, you know, labels like fat and labels like, um, you know, overweight, um, when people are labeled, you know, that, that can affect their mental mental health. That can affect their self-esteem, their self-confidence. Um, you know, media is promoting an importance of thinness to be attractive. However, more recently, we've seen, um, you know, plus size models and body positivity, which is an amazing thing. Um, being overweight is not uh, a death sentence and you don't have to be skinny to be attractive and to feel um, sexy and all those other things that, you know, men and women uh, want to feel, right? So, you know, cultural values are changing a bit. Um, and so we may see a, we may see a reduction um, in some of these, um, some of these disorders, but more often than not, they're going, to, they're going to maintain because again, the vast majority of our culture and in media promotes being thin, looking a certain way. Um, and that's why individuals do certain things to their bodies in order to uh, appease uh, people that might even, not even like them. Uh, the role of the family, obviously, you know, people who are either supporting it or telling you you need to lose weight, telling you you, you look too heavy. Um, you know, there is association between childhood sexual and physical abuse uh, and elevated risk of eating disorder. So coping through uh, with, with the stress and stress through eating, that's a, that's a thing that, that happens all the time. Uh, kind of the factors. Uh, patients with eating disorders display uh, disturbed thinking, right? Oftentimes, it's a rigid, all or none thinking. Someone with anorexia, right? They can't see that they are really, really thin. They think, man, I'm, I'm always going to be fat. I'm fat. I'm fat. I'm fat. I'm overweight. I'm overweight. I'm overweight. I'm overweight. They're looking at themselves, and they, they have this distorted view of themselves when they look in the mirror, and it's an all or none thing. Uh, and then they have maladaptive behaviors. They think that, you know, they're, they'll never be never be thin enough. Right. They'll never be thin. They'll always be overweight. And so they they always do things in an unhealthy way to kind of speed the process up and to maintain uh, a weight. And oftentimes that that is unhealthy. OK. Final unit, um, kind of some new directions um, when we talk about the study of psychological disorders. Uh, one of the first things that we'll talk about is uh, the role of early life stress. Uh, in adult disorders. And what we've begun to see um, with research is that there are studies that link early life stress and the cause of uh, by early childhood trauma to an increased prevalence in a lot of the psychological disorders that we talk about. So when we talk about childhood trauma, that could be anything from physical abuse to uh, parental death, childhood illness, and all of those, uh, again, interact with and can dis disturb 
the the development of the brain and the the brain functioning, right, and the cognitive development of a of a young child. And when that happens, there may be a higher and increased prevalence of those psych psychological disorders we talked about: the anxiety, the dissociative disorders, uh, the bipolar, the personality disorders, and eating or eating disorders, right. But there is more evidence that is needed to show and establish causality. Uh, but again, we do we can see um, over again. And some studies do support it; others may not. Right, but there is some uh, there are some credits and credence to um, how our early childhood experiences can affect our later um, adult experiences with uh, psych psychological and mental disorders. Okay. Uh, the second thing and the last thing that we'll, we'll talk about is that there is some genetic overlap. Um, among major disorders. Uh, many of the disorders that we talked about um, may share uh, genetic and some neurobiological characteristics. So, you know, the, the enlarging of the, the, uh, the ventricles in the brain or the, the larger um, hippocampus and the volume of hippocampus in the brain may influence schizophrenia and it may also influence uh, bipolar disorder, right? So again, there are some different scientists that are seeing some some overlap uh, in some of the, uh, the disorders that individuals are uh, are exhibiting, right? So autism and schizophrenia usually can involve similar neurodevelopmental abnormalities in the brain, right? With, uh, you know, the neural connections in the brain, um, you know, the, the overactivity or the underactivity in the neural circuitry, all right? Um, and genetic mapping, which again, we're looking at uh, individuals in our families and determining if uh, down, the, down the, the family tree, if there are some other individuals who have the disease themselves, again, the genetic mapping has identified that there is some genetic overlap among depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, auti autism, and ADHD, right? So when we think about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, there is a high overlap. So those who have schizophrenia, um, they also may also develop schizophrenia and bipolar, right? Because there's some overlap in kind of the, again, the biological and genetics. Uh, schizophrenia depression, there's a moderate overlap. Um, depression and bipolar disorder, it's a moderate overlap. Uh, we'll look at schizophrenia and autism. There may be uh, less of an overlap relative, relatively, but again, there is some, again, abnormalities in the neurodevelopment that could cause some form of overlap, right? So those are the two, uh, you know, the two new developments as we move forward. Um, looking at early childhood, um, we talked about um, prevention. How do we prevent um, the uh, psychological and mental disorders in young, in young people and adults? Let's think about the early childhood. Uh, let's see, affect the environment that they live in so that we can create a better lived experience for them later on. And then, you know, the overlapping of major, uh, major disorders. And again, we talked about that, um, the continuum. So, you know, these disorders are not just uh, distinct. There may be some overlap in the symptoms that are exhibited um, by, uh, by patients, right? That may have symptoms of schizophrenia. They may also have symptoms of bipolar disorder, right? So there is an overlap there. Um, and we see that schizophrenic bipolar disorder is a thing because some people may exhibit the schizophrenia and they also might have uh, bipolar disorder where they're having depression and then they're also having uh, manic episodes as well okay so we'll stop right there um, we'll end right there um, one thing that i want to mention though is you know when we think about psychological disorders we talked about the stigma we talked about the derogatory labels and the stereotypes that are associated with um, psych psychological disorders but it's always great to just have the knowledge right the more knowledge we have the less we are we, we stigmatize the less we create these derogatory labels and stereotype because we understand that it is not something that is always uh, the person. It's not always about the person. Sometimes it's about the environment. Sometimes it's about the genetics. And so we have to be mindful of that as we uh, talk about um, mental disorders and don't be ashamed um, to, because if we looked at the prevalence, right? There is There are high prevalences for these disorders. One thing that we can do that we saw with etiology is, again, think about the cognitive factors, thinking about the environmental factors, and also think about stress. How do we manage our stress? 
How do we manage our cognitive thinking um, in order to uh, give ourselves an opportunity to have a healthier uh, lived outcome in our uh, in our lives and, and over the course of our, over the course of our, over over the course, excuse me, uh, of our life. Okay. So we'll stop there. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is chapter 14, Psychological Disorders. Uh, stay tuned for chapter 15. Uh, that will be the treatment of psychological disorders, and then we'll be uh, out of here. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.